Let's jump now then <clears throat> from that to the subject of your latest book, um, Parallel Worlds, and, mm -hmm. and talking about going from a concept of universe to multiverse. What does this mean? And what does this what does it mean to be multi-dimensional? And, and how is this something that we can take into consideration in our lives now as we're struggling to go out of a zero to a one? Well, right now we're rewriting all the textbooks in astronomy and cosmology. Cosmology has gone through three revolutions. The first revolution was initiated by Galileo, who turned the telescope to the sky and revealed for the first time the true splendor of the night sky. The second revolution was in the 1920s with the giant telescopes like Mount Wilson, where Edwin Hubble showed that the universe was expanding. So we had this picture, this picture that the universe is in some sense a soap bubble of some sort, and it's expanding, and it's slowing down. And the soap bubble is made out of atoms, because everywhere we look we see atoms of hydrogen, helium, so on and so forth. Well that picture we now know is wrong. Every single cosmology textbook on the Earth is being rewritten because we're now entering the third era, satellites. Satellites have forced us to confront the fact that we may not be alone, that our universe may not be out of, made out of atoms. So first of all, our satellites have shown that most of the universe is not made out of atoms. Every textbook is wrong. Every chemistry class is wrong. Your high school chemistry teacher was wrong in saying that everything's made out of atoms. We now know that most of the universe is made out of dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter makes up 23% of the universe. Dark energy makes up 73% of the universe. The stars make up 4% of the universe. And what about us, the higher elements? We make up 0.03% of the universe. We are by far the vast minority of the universe. The universe is not made out of atoms. And our soap bubble is not slowing down. It's speeding up. It's careening out of control. We now know that the universe is undergoing what is called consider expansion. It's exponentially expanding. It's going to blow out. We can even see the end of the universe. And I'll talk about how the universe will eventually die. As I quote now from the great philosopher Woody Allen, Woody Allen once said, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. <laughs> Well, toward the end, it's not going to be pretty. The universe will freeze over in a big freeze. The last component of that picture of cosmology is also wrong. It's not just one soap bubble. We now believe there are other soap bubbles out there. Soap bubbles that we perchance can't see because it's not part of the same 0.03% of what we are, right? Well, our soap bubble, we're stuck to our soap bubble like flies on flypaper. We cannot leave our soap bubble. Gravity can go between soap bubbles, but we're stuck on our soap bubble. But we think that there are other soap bubbles. Now, they would be invisible because light only moves. Light is also trapped like flypaper, uh, flies on flypaper. Light only goes on the surface of the soap bubble. So if there's another soap bubble right above you, you'd never know it. Now, where have you seen that before? That's in the famous novel, The Invisible Man. In The Invisible Man, H.G. Wells gives you a reason for being invisible. He says it flatly, the fourth dimension, hyperspace. H.G. Wells says that we live on a plane. We spend all our time thinking that our plane is everything there is. But just above us, there could be another plane. The invisible man is invisible because light passes right beneath him. Okay? Now, when I was growing up in San Francisco, I grew up uh, visiting the Japanese tea garden. My mother would spend hours uh, with me in the Japanese tea garden, and I would look at the carp swimming just beneath the lily pads. And I would spend hours looking at them. I would put my nose right up to the fish, and they couldn't see me. Their eyes would point to the side. Their universe was a two-dimensional universe. And then I imagined, what would it be like to be a fish? And I said to myself, what a fantastic world. I could move forward, backward, left and right, but the concept of up, up, made no sense. There is no world of up. Your eyes point to the side. The lily pads show you the, the end of the universe. There is no world of up. And so then I imagined a fish who was a scientist, a scientist fish. You must have been a trippy little kid. <laughs> yeah, a little scientist kid living, swimming in the pond. And the scientist was, would say, wah, humbug. <laughs> There's no world of up. There's only the pond. What you see is what there is. What you can measure 
is what there is. The pond is everything. The pond is all. There's nothing as the world of up. And so then one day, I imagine reaching down and grabbing one of the fish, the scientist fish, lifting the scientist fish up into the world of up. What would he see? He would see beings moving without fins, a new law of physics. Beings breathing without water, a new law of biology. And then I would put the fish back in the pond. And what a story he would tell his friends. He disappeared from the universe <laughs> and wound up in a world of up. Now today, we physicists believe that we are the fish. We spend all our time saying, bah, humbug. There's only the world that you could see and measure. There is forward, backward, left, right, up, down, and that's all there is. The universe is what we can measure. Well, our textbooks are now having to be rewritten. The WMAP satellite currently orbiting the Earth, its data is consistent with what is called inflation. Inflation was proposed by a good friend of mine, Alan Guth at MIT. He mentioned may win the Nobel Prize for this theory. Inflation says that the universe expanded in a hypercharged Big Bang, but it can happen again and again and again. And the soap bubble can fission in half and bud and sprout a baby soap bubble. Universes can have babies. Stephen Hawking calls them baby universes. And we believe that our universe may have come from a parent universe. And perhaps our universe also buds other universes. Now, what about the mathematics? What about the tests? Well, as I said, inflation fits all the data. It doesn't mean it's right but it fits all the data, and inflation is based on the idea that it can happen again and again and again. But what about a theory of inflation? Well, that's where what I do for a living comes into the picture. What I work on for a living is something called string theory. I'm one of the pioneers in the subject. I'm the co-founder of string field theory, which is one of the main branches of string theory. Now, string theory says that it is the theory of everything. Einstein spent the last 30 years of his life chasing after an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that would allow him to read the mind of God. That was the ultimate goal, the holy grail of physics. An equation one inch long, just like E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared unlocked the secret of the stars. That's why stars twinkle. That's why our sun burns. That's why we have energy on the earth. Everything on the earth, all energy on the earth, ultimately comes from E equals MC squared. And as one of your book titles would indicate, it's time to go beyond Einstein. That's right. When we go beyond Einstein now, we now believe that string theory is perhaps a theory of everything. When we smash atoms, we find more particles, lots and lots of particles. So how, why should nature be so malicious as to give us thousands of subatomic particles? In fact, the situation was so bad that J. Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, once said that the Nobel Prize in physics should go to the physicist who does not discover a new particle this year. <laughs> We're drowning in particles. When I got my PhD at Berkeley, I had to memorize all the names of these subatomic particles. <laughs> Kappa mesons, lambda particle, pi mesons, tau mesons, hadrons, leptons. I couldn't get my PhD unless I had bosons and hadrons. I couldn't get my PhD unless I memorized all the names of all these particles. I hope that in the future, to get your PhD, a young graduate student will simply say, string. We think that a vibrating string has notes. Each note corresponds to a subatomic particle. If you can get a microscope and see into the electron, you would see a rubber band, a rubber band, and you kick the rubber band and it vibrates in a different mode. It becomes a neutrino. You twang it, and it becomes a quark. You twang it, it becomes a lepton. You twang it, it becomes a boson. Just a little string. string. So what are we? The subatomic particles are the notes on vibrating strings. What is physics? Physics is nothing but the laws of harmony you can write on strings. Well, then what is chemistry? Chemistry is nothing but the melodies you can play on vibrating strings. Well, what is the universe? The universe is a symphony of strings. And therefore, what is the mind of God? The mind of God, in this picture, 
is cosmic music resonating through 10, maybe 11 dimensional hyperspace. These strings are not ordinary strings. These strings force physical reality to be 11 dimensional.